man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. That was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Verse 9, Satan replies, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have, have you not put a hedge of protection around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then. Everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the land of Uz, there once resided a good man. Not just that, better still, he was a godly man, blameless and upright. He feared God, he shunned evil, and not that the former always results in the latter, like just because someone fears God, this means uh, what I'm about to say, but Job was filthy rich. I mean, the brother was loaded. It, it isn't that he strutted around like a peacock or, or rubbed people's noses in his plenty, that the brother just happened to be exponentially prosperous. For the, re for the record, um, that's not a crime. Although not perfect at all, it can't be understated how devoted Job was to God. I mean, he was the real deal. You weren't going to find Job making it rain inside Ooze's most popular gentleman spot. Uh, Job wasn't the type to exploit his employees. To You weren't going to find him cussing out his wife. He, Job wasn't the kind of person that would refuse to wear a seatbelt. I mean, Job just chose another path. He was dedicated to prudence and justice and temperaments uh, and courage. His entire life resounded with faith, hope, and love. He was, he was so upright, this Job was, that regularly he... Uh, repented on his children's behalf, like we're told in verses four through five. This way, if just by chance, just the mere chance, the, the night before, maybe in some way his kids had entertained ungodly thoughts or deeds, Job's precautionary intercession might protect them from God's discipline. To, to our modern eyes, I mean, we, we'd probably label this kind of conduct as having crossed the line into codependency. A classic example of a father, uh, think of the term helicopter parents, being too tied to the outcome of his children's success or failure. After all, I mean, you can't protect your children from everything, and some lessons do have to be learned the hard way. However, Job isn't living in the age of enlightenment or post-modernity. From for his day and, and for his time, he's a stand-up dude, he's a devout husband and father, and he's just looking out for those that are closest to him, those whom he, in a real way, is responsible for. The saga unfolds uh, a little something like this. One day, an arrangement is made where Satan 
the real enemy of God who roams the earth scheming to steal and kill and destroy, he's granted power by God to test Job's fidelity. As far as Satan imagined, the only intelligible reason for Job's pious life is that he'd been spared from ever, ever feeling the shock and an often persistent sting of tragedy. He, this Job guy, didn't, didn't see, or rather Satan, did not see any other quantifiably concrete explanation otherwise that someone would be that devoted to God. Of course, Job trusts God profoundly. His, his family wasn't good. His family was great. Job wasn't working two jobs, barely making ends meet on minimum wage income. There, there was no agonizing for Job over how he would pay for college or save for retirement. No, no, Job's bank account was beyond swollen. In all fairness, I mean, we aren't told you know, about what his life's beginnings look like, per se. It's, but it's evident by this point in the story, by this point in his life at least, Job, Job wants for nothing. The argument then was that if he were in a less advantageous circumstance where he began to suffer great loss, he will surely curse you to your face. These are the words Satan offers to God in verse 11. In the end, God signs off on uh, Satan's proposal with one caveat, just one, one caveat. Very well, then everything he has is in your power, God says, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Satan could alter everything around Job with Job himself being off limits. These are just some observations that we can make right off the bat. Let me get into these for a minute. Um, however, before uh, we do that, let, let me just, uh, I guess, reiterate or, or stress that we need to grasp that the Bible will never adequately answer every single solitary question about it or life that we have. In the scriptures, most important of all, through the revelation of Jesus, we are taught this very simple truth that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot, has not, will not overcome it. Moreover, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17 declares that all scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What I'm getting at is just this, the, the entire Bible from lengthy genealogies to the intricate minutia of Levitical law, from Lot's wife dying as a pillar of salt to the, the Tower of Babel and Sodom and Gomorrah and Rebecca's well-crafted plan to pilfer a birthright, from, from Jesus sending demon-possessed pigs to a watery grave and raising the dead to life, even as he was raised to life by the Father, it is all for the glory of God and for our benefit. None of it, none of it can be redacted. None of it can be expunged. Within it is all that we need, together with the Holy Spirit, to tutor us as our rule for life and living faithfully as God's beloved. Still, Whatever inquiries we have about the Bible, I mean, they are good to ask in private and in community with others. For example, while reading this text, I, I think, I mean, before Job is even brought into the picture, why is God having a conversation with Satan anyway? Maybe, maybe you think that too. I mean, this is the adversary, Satan, aka the accuser. 
the Satan, the, the personification of all evil. This, this, this is Satan, the Lucifer, a, a one-time angelic being who was expelled from heaven for trying to overthrow God. Like this dude is an extra special kind of crazy. And God knows he's up to no good, so why is God even entertaining him? And then, I mean, what about what about our homeboy Job? I mean, he he here he is, he's a stand-up dude, he's he's minding his own business. He's running errands at Costco with his non-surgical mask on. You know, he's diligently social distancing, not six feet, but eight feet away because he wants to be extra safe. You know, he he stops traffic to help elderly ladies cross the street. I mean, Job, like, real for real loves God. He volunteers at the Salvation Army and regularly buys Starbucks for his large number of servants. Remember, he was the greatest among all the people of the East. I mean, you got to put some respect on Job's name, you would think. And yet, God ends up being the instigator that, unbeknownst to Job, of course, leads to his involvement in this whole matter. After roaming throughout the earth, it's the Lord who said to Satan in verse 8, have, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright. He's a man who fears God and shuns evil. I mean, goodness gracious. Come on now, God. You, you got to help a brother out. I, I, this is just a sampling of what comes to my mind when I read a text like this. I wonder what comes to your mind. Some questions we'll receive clarity about and others not so much, but it's always good to ask. The Bible contains various genres or types of writings. There, there are laws, poetry, narrative, history, letters, prophecy, and so on. You know, you, you don't want to treat laws like letters or treat history like prophecy, but if you follow Christ, you do want to treat it all as true and reliable. What I want to cover now just for the next few minutes that we have, uh, which I hope that you'll take home with you, is, is found in, in verse 9. Satan responds to God's comment publicizing Job's holiness with two inquiries. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge of protection around him and his household and everything he has? Satan asks. Now, the, the premise behind the proposal is that it's absolute rubbish to think that someone would display such devout allegiance to God if they are suffering rather than if they are flourishing. I like to imagine Satan as snarky and narcissistic in his dealings and sarcastic even because we know him to be the author of all lies. He relentlessly uh, lets loose chaos and, and aims to dissuade people from choosing God. But in this case, while his motive per, per usual is, is less than virtuous, I mean, it isn't like the broader thought is coming from left field. There, there's no question that our motives for following God vary and may at some point contribute to either further supporting or disproving that we have truly committed ourselves to the narrow way that is found in following Jesus. Many people approach Christianity like a kind of spiritual Ponzi scheme where the better life gets for them, usually financially, that somehow means that God is pleased and in effect, investing in them more and more, that God is gonna to continue to pour into them. Others are all about holding to biblical principles in theory until doing just that sparks parades of ridicule or anguish in their life. I mean, it's easy to fall into a passive prosperity gospel that says, above all else, God's chief goal, God's chief concern in life is that you would be free from sickness, that you would be free of poverty and strife and struggle of any kind. And in fact, he wants nothing more in this line of thinking than for his disciples to know opulence at every turn. That makes me think about my own why. You know, and why 
why I follow God. And, and you should think about your own why as well. With so much of life being as unjust as it is, as erratic and upside down, why is it that you follow God? That you sincerely aim to serve his purposes and not your own? Does God represent for you a kind of get out of jail free card? Have you been serving him? Because, I mean, as far as you can tell, thus far, it's worked out pretty well to your liking. And so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is, is that why you follow God? In a book that he edited, uh, Don't Call It a Comeback, The Old Faith for a New Day, Pastor Kevin DeYoung wrote these words. He wrote, shallow Christianity will not last in the coming generation, and it will not grow. Cultural Christianity is fading. The church in the 21st century must go big on truth or go home, he writes. I'd, I'd add that one way of going home, or rather one way of going big, is to ensure that our beliefs align with the Bible. Not what people said about the Bible, not what your friend group said about the Bible, not what you think it said even though you ain't read it, but what the Bible says. And all of that will then inform our capacity to live the, the simple truths of faith with integral consistency. It's been said that most people wish to serve God, but only in an advisory capacity. Most people wish to serve God, but only in an advisory capacity. The thing is, though, that just won't work. God is not an elective advisor or consultant whose services we employ for some projects, but not for others. God is the sole architect and Lord over our life and this entire world. I, I got to tell you, you, you can't serve God for your parents. Having Christian parents and having participated in maybe endless church programming your entire life does not guarantee anything faith-wise. Your mother and father must answer for themselves before God, and the same goes for you. In a world and society that increasingly paints it as a highly unintelligent decision, the question is, why do you, why, why do you love God? For me, I, I serve God because ultimately he's, he's all that I have to depend on as God. And, and, and more than that, he deserves my full attention and obedience. It's a joy to do what God desires, not a burdensome rote obligation, even though I don't understand or enjoy every leg of the journey. Did y'all catch that? I do not enjoy or understand every leg of the Christian journey. At age 20, I went to church for the first time in my entire life. I was reared in an environment where Jesus was not spoken of and biblical principles were not lived out. And so it was during this very normal, nondescript worship service, just a normal, regular Sunday at Maple Springs Baptist Church that my brokenness was finally grasped. I, I realized that I was a sinner. I wasn't concerned about the person sitting next to me and what they had, did or did not do. I wasn't concerned about the preacher and what he did or did not do. I realized that I, James Ellis III, no middle name, was broken and I needed saving and I needed Jesus. These 21 years later, every day that I am, am blessed to wake up, I sort of reaffirm that profession of faith that I, that I made way back then when I declared with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I, I had done life my own way and it proved pointless. So I'm pretty well determined by now that whatever the circumstances are, whether I find myself in need or I find myself in plenty, I'm, I'm going to go hard in the paint for Jesus. I'm going to make sure that I persist running this marathon of faith as best as I can with God's help. 
Now, if you don't follow God, this is as good of a time as any to truly investigate what it is that's stopping you from giving your life to Jesus, from surrendering to him and following him for the rest of your life. The reality is, oh, I got to tell you guys, God does not owe you. God does not owe me. God does not owe Job or anyone anything. He stands alone, God does. He's triumphant. And yet, in his limitless autonomy, the hound of heaven that we call him, God chases after us because of love. Whatever it is that you believe, you need to know why you believe it. May the Lord our God be your anchor in joy and pain from now and until the end of the ages. May God be with you. Amen.